when you're out there racing, you have your data screens in front of you if you're racing by heart rate or power or whatever you're doing. But at the end of the day, it's how you feel. Yes. And, you know, sometimes your power numbers might be low, but you're feeling really good. And and don't let that get in your head. I mean, most the best athletes also race by feel. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. Angela and I are here today post-camp. This will come out in a few days, but we had a lovely training camp down in Claremont, Florida with an awesome group of women. And during that time, we asked them to write down questions they had about anything. And we have all the questions, so we're going to call this part one of our question and answer from these women and they're really awesome and Angela has not seen them because I like surprising you <laughs> um, so these are all over the map we're just gonna go in and get started because that's why we know you are here so let's do it all right question number one you ready right. how important are paddles for swimming Oh, I think we could answer everyone. It depends. It depends. <laughs> oh, we're so good at that. I know this is actually such a good question. Mm -hmm. I really like paddles. Just, I mean, there's so many reasons for paddles. Um, one of the first and foremost reasons I like bringing gear into swimming is because it brings fun to it. So if you're coming from a non-swim background or having difficulty to just swim 25 meters or yards, or even just finish a 500 to 1500 yard set, bringing paddles, bringing any type of gear to kind of help assist you to do that, to just get in the water and, and complete a session is very beneficial. I used to work with Amy Jones, which many people know, and that was her thing. Like make swimming fun, no matter what it is. If you need shorts, if you need paddles, if you like paddles, like bring that into the pool because it'll, it'll offset the stuff that you don't necessarily like. So that's number one, fun. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like paddles because they're fun mm -hmm. <laughs> and they generally make most people faster. Mm -hmm. Number two, I like paddles is, is it's direct strength work yes. right into your swim swimming. And if you have pretty good swim form and even if you don't, depending on what type and style of paddle you use, it'll kind of help you learn where to press on the water and yep. bring it back. Or it'll teach you like it will show you directly if you're pressing down toward the bottom of the pool versus back behind you to, m to move you forward. If you're more aware of that with the paddles. One thing I love about paddles and actually any type of equipment, you take paddles on, paddles off, paddles on, and you keep going back and forth. You, you learn to feel the water a bit more. Um, it's just like when you put your hands in fists or put flippers on. Um, everything changes in the feel of the water and then you take it off and you actually ha have to feel the water and it just is a proprioceptive tactic, but, um, allowing the swimmer to feel. And that's what you want. Like if you're a young kid growing up swimming, you have such great feel of the water that you don't even know about it. Um, <clears throat> so that, those are my two basic things, um, is strength and then obviously the fun. How about yeah. you? Yeah. Um, I like them because I do, I mean, I love any strength work and I really, I can just, I feel myself getting stronger with the mm -hmm. paddles. Like I can feel it in my lats, hopefully. <laughs> and it does make me a little faster. So if I've got, you know, two hundreds, four hundreds with paddles, uh, I can get that done a little faster. Um, actually weirdly, sometimes the paddles help with my kick. Mm. kick timing. Yeah. Um, it slows you down. It slows cool. you down and I can really feel, I can time my kick better when I have paddles. And recently we've been doing this and I've been doing this is I've been putting my hands into fists and just holding the paddles at the top mm -hmm. and using paddles that way. It mm -hmm. really helps you with the catch. Cause if you're not catching right, that paddle's going to slip out. Mm -hmm. Um, so I love paddles. The only thing I would say, and I've said this before is if you're listening to this, don't use paddles if you don't have fairly good form because you're going to feel it right away in your shoulders. Um, so I don't like to give paddle work until I know somebody has a pretty solid catch or has, or has a pretty, like a decent form. Um, and they're not 
coming straight down and pressing down on the water and stressing out their shoulder. I mean, you might feel that right away. One thing that I think works Mm -hmm. too is start with fists. Put your Mm -hmm. hands in fists, take away your actual fingers in the feel and do fists and then your straight arm hand. Um, The other thing with the paddle work especially is I think a lot of people go and buy paddles that are just these massive plates and that's just going to cause issues. So I always like to start people with even just tiny um, finger paddles. You can get these Mm. little things that are like four or five inches long. But then the first and foremost paddle that I love for everyone is it just should cover your hand. No bigger. If it's bigger, it's too much right now. And even even I've been swimming for a long time and I still use pretty small paddles. Mm -hmm. I do have a variety of paddles and there's so many different ones out there. But if you're just starting with paddles or don't know if you have a good form or things are causing issues, go smaller. Always go smaller. And you don't need curved paddles. You don't like the best paddle I feel is just a straight paddle um, because it's not moving your fingers or anything in a weird position it's just allowing you to like basically put pressure on the on the palm of your hand which is what you want when you take the paddles away I actually just changed my paddles I had the paddles that had the band around your finger and the Mm -hmm. wrist and I just I actually went back to an original paddle I was using where I just stick my thumb in it Mm -hmm. Um, if you do have paddles and you're strapping your wrist down I suggest you actually just take that strap out Mm -hmm. and only strap your like fingers down because you're gonna know if your form is off it's I just I just really like the change of paddle now to only where I stick my thumb in it keeps me I guess it keeps me a little more honest Mm -hmm. with my stroke I also like and you do too I mean it's not this is coming out in winter, but I like using paddles in, um, the open water in the pond. Mm -hmm. Like I'll make a loop with paddles and then I'll drop them and make, and then do one without. Um, so you can continue that strength work throughout the season if you want to. Yeah. And if you're doing longer stuff, what I do is just throw the paddles in the back of my swimsuit. Mm -hmm. And it's actually good because it makes you aware where your low back is, which you want on top of the water. So you can feel the water flow on the paddle on the back. Um, but yeah, almost every single one of my paddles, I have one little loop for one finger and Mm -hmm. I've done that for years and years just because, and I actually sometimes do no, no loop. So you actually, it's a good experiment for people is you take a flat paddle and you hold it up in recovery phase. And then when you get into the water, you open up your hand and pull back. And if you can sustain that paddle back, you have good form. Yeah. So it's really, really good exercise. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the question is how important are they? I think if you're a long course athlete and you're trying to really build endurance, muscular endurance in the swim and strength, I would say they're pretty important. If for some reason you absolutely do not love paddles, then don't use them. I, or try paddles with flippers or with a buoy, yes. something to mm-hmm. kind of assist it. Yeah. But I, for me, I find them very important with long course because they really, they make me feel strong in, in endurance swimming when I'm not using them. So yeah. I really like them. All right. Moving on. Oh, this is a really interesting one. I'm not going to look. She's, you don't peek at this. I can't. I don't have glasses. You don't have glasses on. <laughs> You're blind as a bat. I am. <laughs> All right. Should I sign up for a gravel try or Xterra if I have no access to trails for trail running? How can I simulate a train? Oh, oh, sorry. How can I simulate or train for a trail run without trails? So this is a triathlon gravel gravel race? try, and there's not okay. actually there's not uh, many of these. But she's yes. not talking. I, I actually, when I read this, I read this a little too quickly, and I thought she was talking about biking. Like mm-hmm. if I don't, but she's not. She's just talking about like actually an like an Xterra, like trail running. Um, this is an interesting question. I would say take away the should and ask yourself, do you want to? Mm-hmm. That's the first question. Do you want oh, to? Okay. I'd say yes. I was not expecting that. Yeah. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then, yeah. So I, I did my first Xterra, which is, I mean, I guess we're just going to call it Xterra. It doesn't have to be on a mountain bike, but it's, yeah. it is trail. Yeah. And I mean, there's trails around here, but I've never really, I mean, I suck at trails. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. We say this all the time. Goodness. you. Stink. Yeah. But I still signed up because I wanted to do it. So take away the should. If you want to do it, do it. Yeah. Now, in terms of training, I mean, obviously, the more you can get on some type of weird ter- terrain, like even if there's a ditch or like um, side uh, dirt along a path mm-hmm. that's paved, anything that is that's kind of that's kind of uneven is going to help you get that 
eye foot coordination. Like every time I do a recovery run, even if I'm on the bike path, I go on the dirt on the mm-hmm, side yeah. and I just, it weirdly just helps. Um, so you could do that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, if you absolutely have no access to trails, which I find it hard for me, I'm, I mean, there's always access. Like even if you can drive somewhere on a I, weekend, yes, I guess if you can drive, like, like do something that kind of mimics what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is just it, it really is that eye foot coordination. So even going to um, a stadium where there's stairs, mm-hmm. like anything that will challenge you in, in that in that area, I yeah. think would be helpful. Um, yeah, I was yeah. even thinking some like if you absolutely cannot get to a trail, well, if you can get to a dirt road, mm-hmm. like just run on the dirt road because that's mm-hmm. still going to give you a little unevenness. And I do find, well, except for yours, <laughs> but the trails that you're running on in some of these races are not crazy technical. Yours was wildly technical. It was insanely technical. I don't it know was why. Like a hike, hike up a mountain. Yeah. So that was okay. <laughs> I, so that was weird. But, um, You know, I was thinking, I lost my train of thought there, but I was thinking even doing some lateral plyo stuff Mm -hmm. and jumping over stuff so you can get used to kind of landing on one foot. And I'm talking side, do side to side stuff. You can hop over a towel, Um, basically getting your feet like landing side to side. So, and hops, oh, hopscotch. Yep. So I think you can 100% do it without a trail run, but it, it would be worth if you are going to plan to do it, and I think it would be fantastic, you know, once every two weeks driving somewhere Mm -hmm. for a trail run, just to get a sense of it, you really can train a lot on roads. It's Mm -hmm. that's totally fine because it's going to be fitness anyway. Um, And then if worse comes to worse, you can do what Angela did, which is basically just kind of crawl your way. (laughs) to. Hey, I still won the race. You still won it. You're a fast crawler. (laughs) You're a a fast fast crawler. It was legitimately crawling with my hands, holding on to trees yeah <laughs> and then just remember that you go in it with just no expectations and have fun yeah um i do i love trail running uh i it and, is yeah. yeah i kind of embraced it a bit more now every time yeah. i do recovery run on the so, dirt roads it's i go soft. on dirt yeah, yeah. it's kind of nice it's kind of nice all right moving on what is the best way to incorporate strength training into tri training that is a million dollar question so how do you do it Best way to incorporate. Well, I basically just put it on my schedule to make sure I do it. Yep. Um, I like two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. Um, For a lot of my athletes, it's one to two times because they really are time crunched. Um, And I like to get in the gym. I really like to lift heavy Mm -hmm. at least once or twice a week and then do more functional stuff on the side. Every day I do some type of little exercises and I think everybody can incorporate a single leg deadlift even if they don't have a weight at home you can use a gallon of ice cream or, or milk or whatever. <laughs> uh, but you can use some type of offset to weight um with or without you know all that like a like a sit to stand squat single leg you can do all of these small things every day to incorporate it but i really suggest going to the gym once or twice a week and just lift heavy it doesn't have to be long it could be a hack squat it could be leg press it just something to really put some weight into your system mm-hmm. Um, another way to incorporate it is low cadence work on the bike, like really low cadence, like 50 or 60 RPM paddle work in the swim. Um, and for the run, running uphill is, is really like ways to incorporate strength within the context of the actual sport. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I try to really build a solid foundation of strength in the off season, or building up to a race. So it's usually eight to 12 weeks of strength and progressing the athlete from more like longer reps Mm -hmm. to shorter ones, but yep, pretty standard. Yeah. And I think, um, I would pick if you're having trouble fitting it in because you're super time crunch and you're like, look, I have time for a 45 minute run a day or Mm -hmm. an hour bike. And that's it. I don't have try to pick five exercises put them in your basement, um, a push, a pull, a squat, a lunge, a hinge, compound exercises, make them make the most bag for your buck. So a squat to an overhead press or something, a plank with a leg raise in the back to get glued, mm-hmm. everything plank to push up, you know, a backwards lunge with a rotation or something, get your rotation in, um, and pick five exercises 
literally do them two or three times through. It might take only 15 minutes, but it is better than nothing. You're still going to make adaptations. Uh, that's, and, yeah. and, and, and even if that's too much, just pick two. And yeah. like every time you run, you pick two and just go through them all. Mm-hmm. You know, anytime you can build strength throughout the day. I mean, I just think it's very valuable to have functional movements with weight. Uh, I mean, it transfers over so much like triathlon. I always say even any type of endurance sport is a strength sport at the same time. Like you have to have the strength to build your chassis so that you can run faster or longer or the duration needed. Yeah. And I think once you, once you kind of figure out why you need to do it, instead of just like, Mm -hmm. strength train. when you think about why do I strength train? And I strength train to have muscular endurance. I strength train to build muscle because muscle protects the bone. (laughs) And I strength train for power so I can, you know, get my leg turnover. Um, Whatever it is, you know, if you find your why with that strength training, that will work. I also, for my athletes, and every athlete is different, is I try to figure out when what they like to pair strength training with so i have some athletes who would like who strength train on swim days because they're already like at their gym or at the y mci wherever they swim um i have some athletes who like to train strength on run days and we have like a big kind of overload day and an easier one so um also figure out how to fit that in uh and that is i mean It's just kind of like, how do you fit in cycling? How do you fit in swimming? If you can only do it once a week, that's fine. But right now in the, I guess we're in our base season is the time to try to do at least twice a week, like Angela said, um, and back off, you know, if you cut 10 minutes off a bike right now, unless you have a race coming up, Mm -hmm. uh, if you cut 300 yards off a swim. And that gives you, you know, I don't even know, 10 minutes to do something. Uh, that's good enough. Well, and I even heard some people like putting, um, like a 15 pound weight by the bathroom. Like every time you go to the bathroom, okay, go to the bathroom and then you have to do 10 squats. Oh my gosh. Like like you can, like, that's why I like the, like in this cottage, like I have weights and stuff here. So I work and then it's like, I do an exercise. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm constantly trying to do something in I mean, not every day, believe me. I yeah. Coach. <laughs> <laughs> but make, make, uh, work your life around strength training. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, I do think. And just remember the why, but this kind of build this question, I pulled both these questions out cause we have a lot. And so this is on the same vein. So I'm just going to read this question and it's going to be almost the same response, but I want to read it. Uh, tips or tricks to get yourself to do prehab mobility before the run. It's simple, but it's so boring. So this is in the same vein. And I have to say, um, it's, it's simple like to this. And we're talking about like maybe doing monster walks, some clamshells, waking up your glutes, uh, donkey kicks, anything, all the things, um, with bands and calf raises and all of that you are trying to wake up your muscles and you're trying to strengthen all those little muscles. And that is injury prevention. And so the older I get and the more like little injuries or things that bother me, um, the more I do it. So this is about remembering your why. Um, yeah. And, I'll, and to make it even sim- simple on my, like my end, throw in one of your favorite songs, mm-hmm. put it on high Mm-hmm. And just say, okay, I'm going to do fun exercises until that song's done. Three minutes. Yeah. And it's like, it's a simple way to kind of upregulate your system in terms of like energetic mm-hmm. feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it'll just put you in a good mindset as well. So like five birds with one stone. <laughs> five birds with one stone. <laughs> I thought you were about to say your favorite song. I was like, what song is five birds? All right, wait, I'm going to put you on the spot. What song would you put on? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, that's just a really bad ad question to ask me because I don't uh-huh. follow the new hits. But ever. you don't have to follow the new hits. It's your song. What song? I would honestly just go to Spotify uh-huh. and put on one of my favorite lists of songs and just whatever comes up or whatever suits me. Okay. It, I mean, I'm not going to say a song because I don't know. <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I know what I like when I hear it. Uh huh. All it right. Is, it's not Taylor Swift to start <laughs> listeners sorry well I'm yeah more you of could... a classic rock slash rock slash 
You can put Even on the, country. T- the 10 minute version of all too well. And there's your 10 minute warm up. I will sometimes, cause when I know I have 10 minutes left in a run and I just want to like have, cause you know, like I'm like, Oh, if I, I can get this done in one song. So mm-hmm. I tell my headphones to play. I said, uh, hey Siri, play the 10 minute version of Taylor Swift's all too well. Mm-hmm. And so I know when I'm done with that song, <laughs> I'm home. But yeah, I know another, another thing yeah. too, for like, like the rehab stuff and the little exercises. I love listening to podcasts. Yes. Um, so I always put on a podcast and I set my timer and I say, okay, 30 minutes. And I don't look at anything. I just listen and I just do exercises. And I know for 30 minutes that I'm going to do all yeah. these exercises in the so context good. of 30 minutes. I'm smiling because I just uh, said to my that the hey you know what and my phone just started playing that oh. song <laughs> so <laughs> I was like where is that you probably I don't even know if you heard it but I was like where is that music coming from yeah I think the the last thing I'll say about like the prehab and even strength training because sometimes I like to do a little strength training before my run is I find I'm um, I feel so much better within that first five or ten minutes mm-hmm. if I've done not just like a little warm up where you're just like doing some walking lunges and some air squats. But if I've done a solid for me, it's like 10 minutes. If I've done a solid glute warm up with bands and a hip warm up and a little bit of pogo jumping, I just feel so strong when mm-hmm. I start out instead of that first mile feeling like, like just not good. Yeah, no, um, I agree. It's activating everything in the right way. Yeah. Um, so, so there you go. Hopefully we answered that question. All right. This is an interesting question. I'm not sure who wrote it. These were all anonymous. Uh, what is the best way to improve your biking quickly? Ooh. Consistency. Consistency. That's my number one. If you can get on your bike more, you're going to improve better, obviously. And just being consistent with it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in terms of like, let's say you've been riding for a while and you have a few hours every week or what have you. I mean, the best way to improve is go is just do higher intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is a kind of a broad question because I don't know who's asking it, what the context is in terms of what their races are, what their background is. But as a general trend to improve biking, it's increased intensity and duration and intensity over duration. Um, Yeah, because this could be somebody who's like, Oh my gosh, I signed up for a sprint triathlon in six Mm -hmm. weeks and I haven't been on my bike in three months. Or this could be someone Mm -hmm. who's like, I signed up for my first 70.3 and it's in four months. Okay. So let's just, let's just make an athlete. Uh, Okay. Person's an Olympic athlete. Okay. It's done a few Olympics now jumping into their first half. Okay. So that's where they're at. Okay. Well, if they've done a few. Is it see now that I feel like I feel like I mean there's so many I was gonna say in, is it off season have they been variables. riding yeah it's right now it's right now I mean, that's they asked the question now okay so an Olympic jumping into the first half um, they're the, halfs in June they're halfs in June okay the first thing I would do is three times a week start try to get them on the bike three times a week um, mm-hmm. and of course like I have all these questions I, you know what I feel like we're doing right now have you ever seen the videos where they're um, it's like the ER or like a doctor who it's like one minute to diagnosis mm, where mm-hmm. they're like, uh, what's their blood labs? And like, you have to we, keep going. We had to do this in clinicals for physical therapy yeah. where it's like you're presented a uh, client mm-hmm. or a patient. Yeah. And you literally have to diagnose someone two minutes or less for the exam. And yeah, it's the same yeah. thing. Like you're like, <laughs> my heart rate just went up because now I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, do they, do they have a tough work schedule? You yeah. know what I mean? Let's just pretend that they do have time but, uh, and flexibility. Yeah. I think overall there could just be a general trend. Consistency is king. Yeah. So three times a week, three times a week. Okay. Minimum. Minimum. I would say one of those, I would say do long endurance. Right. So that could be anywhere from an hour to five hours to well, be honest and I think that's Maybe. how you build if yeah. you have if you have uh, I guess five months to build you know you start with an hour an hour and a half on the weekend yeah um and then you slowly slowly build with some recovery weeks in there yeah. and that does not have to be intense no. that is just building Long the aerobic. engine yeah um it can be recovery pace it can be z- aerobic pace you know you can throw I like to throw stuff in there to make it fun especially if you're on the trainer um so, and then if you have two other rides, make one of those have some, at least one have some intensity. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and anywhere from one minute efforts to 10 minute efforts, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. 
Um, and then the other one, I mean, you can do some big gear work. You can do another intensity day, depending on how much time you have. Yeah, I would do I would do more strength if mm-hmm. you are only riding three days. Yeah, a week. that's true. Four. I would. Um, and then and and then that's you know, I mean, I'm I'm thinking what is quickly. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. What is quick mean? Are I we mean, talking like basically six? best bang for your buck for mm-hmm. every workout that you're doing so get rid of the fluff yeah um recovery rides and recovery stuff is very very helpful but if you are an athlete that only has like six to eight hours a week to train yeah bang for your buck like the if you're if you do those three workouts that's that's a lot of intensity it's cohesive and that's the best way to improve quickly yes overarching theme and then i was thinking you know i mean this is the best way to improve your biking and then all of a sudden in my head i'm thinking well, are we also talking bike handling? And so my thing is for those long rides, if you're, as soon as it gets warm out, or if you're in a warm place, do those outside if you can, if it's safe, if you have, the outside riding is going to improve your, if we're just talking overarching biking, outside riding is going to improve your biking pretty quickly. You're going to become way more comfortable on the bike uh, from everything to being able to drink your water bottle I mean, even you might be able to change a flat. <laughs> so all sorts of things, outdoor riding. I mean, as soon as the weather gets better, I'm mostly outside, except when I'm teaching my spin classes, which is it's indoor riding. I'm not against indoor riding year round, but uh, get out there. So consistency, a little bit of intensity, a long duration a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, there you go. Uh, oh, while we were at camp, this is for everybody. We had uh, Garmin come and do this amazing talk about uh, their about their products, and we asked a lot of questions about the way their products work and watches and all sorts. We learned so much. So this question kind of comes out of that, just for some background. And I really love this question because I go back and forth on this. She says, "Great talk on gadgets and data, but." How do you balance all of this with just doing it? Yeah, I mean, it depends what kind of data you're looking at. Um, I mean, in terms of data, when we had this talk, he talked about all the different types of sleep scores you can get, HRV, everything to kind of tell you your health stats. And I would say that's not fluff. It's 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 pertinent in some cases, but in terms of just do, mm-hmm. I would disregard that. Um especially if you're not someone to really dive into stuff and focus on the data of heart rate. Mm -hmm. Um, I think heart rate is a very valuable tool for anybody to one, learn what actual their body is doing and dealing with while they're swimming, biking and running. Mm -hmm. Um, And then compare, compare that to perceived effort. And in that, in that realm, that's where you can do the just do. I mean, you can only go so far with, a bunch of data and analyzing and going over things where it's like, you just got to get the work done. You know, you got to get out there and run at Mm -hmm. some point. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think just choose, choose your poison basically, if you think of it as too much. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some people listening who just love gadgets and data and they love having all the things and looking at it and analyzing it after and, what was, or in the morning, what was my sleep score and what's my HRV? And that's awesome. Like if you love all that, or you love just looking at your HRV, do it. Um, Yes. I I love that you said heart rate first. I think that's really, really good. I would say that if you have a coach, let them look at your data (laughs) um, and help you plan that out. And uh, sometimes I just like put in to my athletes plans. I think I talked about this before, like just go run, (laughs) like don't even look at anything, you know, just keep it what you think is easy and just go run. And you know what we didn't do at camp that I thought you were going to do that you thought you're going to make everybody take their watch off. Yeah. I talked about a little bit, but, um, I think a lot of them are returnees and they understand my, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the water, I, I find a lot of people get in their heads with stop, start and trying Mm -hmm. to get to laps and, and, this reminds me of a quote. I don't know who said it. I think it was my, one of my first coaches. Mm-hmm. Don't think, just do. Right. So if you find yourself in a workout, stopping and starting your watch all the time, looking at yes. pace and getting discouraged or, you know, wasting time, basically, mm-hmm. just stop. Like, just do the workout mm-hmm. and figure out the data later or just get rid of the data. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, triathletes are notorious to bring their pool, their watches in the pool. And it's just, it's so 
dumb to me. And I'm very blunt with this because Mm -hmm. you have a workout. It's 3000 yards. It's, it's 10, one hundreds. I mean, okay. So you get in the clock at 140 or whether it be 140 or 142 or whatever, pick a time off a clock to repeat that. I mean, that's the way to get faster, not stopping starting your watch. And like if you could pause your watch or push off the wall in a slightly different fashion. That's half a second right mm-hmm. there. Like you're not going to find improvement by stopping and starting your watch and finding out what you do for 10 one hundreds by that watch time. Do right. 10 one hundreds on two minutes send off mm-hmm. and see how much rest you get in between. Like, like try to improve that versus like the one second or the half second of how fast you can touch your Watch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you I like using my watch because I cannot count. I can do 10 one hundreds. But I think it's a good challenge for you. Oh my god. I literally <laughs> and I even I just I like but it then, when my watch you know vibrates. What I would I would I would say uh-huh. to you is you're 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 thinking of too much stuff while you're swimming then. No, I'm not thinking of anything. Like I just I cannot like well, I, then I think lose, you need to think. I think I need to think of how much yeah. I cannot I cannot I, I do get a sense. You know what? I think it's also too because so I swim I in used a, to be that same. Yeah, I swim in an endless pool for part of the week mm-hmm. and then a lap pool. And so an endless pool is perfect. Cause I just put my watch on, like, it's like cardio. I just yeah. record the time I'm swimming and I don't worry about pace. Like I just do it by time. Like mm-hmm. I might do four minutes of something, but anyway. Um, so when I go to the lap pool, I don't have as much of an innate clock of mm-hmm. like, ooh, that feels like two hundred. I mean, neither do I. Are you sure? I feel like you might know. I you, count. I do, count. Do you count? I feel like yeah, sometimes you might, do you know though? You're like, oh, I bet this is 400. I guess you, I guess you wouldn't know because you don't wear a watch. No, I, I yeah. count, I count laps. I cannot do that. I don't, and you, I, and you can do math with it. Like, okay. Like, yeah. Uh, or, I get you lost. Know, I try or, to count and I get lost. I, I break it down in hundreds oh, okay. to be honest. Mm-hmm. So I know when I did a hundred, okay, mm-hmm. now I'll start. Or when I'm doing like say a one K warm up, mm-hmm. I break it down into 20 laps. I count to 20 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's 500. And then I do it again. Yeah. I always break it down in 500s. Yeah. I do know some people when you have to do like 10, one hundreds and you're yeah. not wearing a watch, like you can put little things on the side of the deck. You can move stuff to be like, all right, that was like some people use like whatever, like they'll like move their flipper a certain way to like say oh, like, boy. that's what, yeah, people cannot count. <laughs> and then someone on the side of the thing is like, puts the thing. Like, oh, so no. no, I do understand. I, I, and so I think, in when we talk about all this, and this is kind of part of this podcast, like at the end of the day, it's swim, bike and run, and it's consistency, and it's having fun with it. Yes, you want to if you're coach, you know, with all this data, you know, and you want to hit some tempo intervals and stuff, and it's whatever, like, yes, you want to do that. But you don't have to be looking at your watch the whole time. I mean, I still put in most of my workouts old school, I build some of them that are complicated through so it shows Mm -hmm. up on the watch. But Mm -hmm. some of it's like, just go run, you know, progress it for 30 minutes and then do like three by eight tempo, you know, on this. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, so you don't constantly have to be looking at like, when's the watch going to beep and tell me to move into this heart rate zone. Yeah. Um, And then I think if you are using say power for running and heart rate, like, and sometimes things don't work. Like for example, I did intervals today mm -hmm. and my, my stride was not working. It was freezing cold. I'm like, I'm not going home to figure this out. So I just, I just did the workout. The workout was built on my Garmin. I, I did the time mm-hmm. and everything. And I just went by perceived effort because yeah. I didn't have the data points to show how fast it was. I still got a workout in. Yeah. I still went as hard as I could no matter what anyway. Uh-huh. So it's like all this extra data meant nothing in the end because I just needed to do. And right. so that's where I think if it gets overcomplicated, it becomes not fun in, at times. And yes. you just have to let go of all that and have fun with it, you know? Yeah. And remember... When you're out there racing, you have your data screens in front of you if you're racing by heart rate or power or whatever you're doing. But at the end of the day, it's how you feel. Yes. And, you know, sometimes your power numbers might be low, but you're feeling really good. And and don't let that get in your head. I mean, most the best athletes also race by feel. So you should be able to train by feel too. And the more you train, the more you know, you know what? I think I know exactly where I am. Uh, in terms of heart rate or power. So also listen to your body. And so go out with, you know, go out without any technology, without a watch and, and just go do it. Um, totally fine. Especially, I mean, it's so, it's freeing. We get so caught up uh, in this data. 
All right. We have two more questions for this go around. So we don't make this podcast like three hours long. This is a really good one. When changing nutrition brands, how long do we try it for before we decide it's a no go? Um, well, I would give it at least a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always, I always find these questions funny because any gel and stuff is going to work. It's Mm -hmm. all just like, if, like, if you're sensitive to texture, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm just just like, (laughs) I get it. I get it. When I first started triathlon, I thought a gel was disgusting. I Mm -hmm. never took them, but it's like, if you, I mean, you got to look at what it is. It's fuel to, for the system. And so I can literally take anything. Yeah. It might taste crappy, but it's going to help me. So I find in general, when I work with athletes that are having struggles, I say, give it a couple weeks on Mm -hmm. something. I suggest something to them. They try it. They either adopt it or they don't, Mm -hmm. or they come back to it. I actually had an athlete, uh, I call, this is kind of a sidebar, but she called me yesterday and she just wanted to thank us, mm-hmm. both of us. I meant to tell you for the oh. podcast because she was, uh, we were, we like talked about nutrition and t- trying gels and doing all this stuff. And she just, after listening to our podcast, she listened to it three times <laughs> and it finally stuck. Yeah. And then she started doing it and uh-huh. it was fantastic for her. Oh, just like started like fueling, fueling correctly, correctly oh, and using gels in general. Yeah. Um, but I think it might take a couple weeks if you're not used to something for sure. And plus it's just habitual too. Like if you're trying to ingest more carbohydrates per hour, your body needs to adapt to that. Yeah. Just like anything. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you kind of got to force it at first too, because it is something new and, um, it takes a little bit of practice for the gut to get used to it. Um, but in my experience, it only takes a couple of weeks to really adapt to anything. Like I could improve my carbohydrate intake when I started uh, looking at actual grams per hour and I was only saying taking 50 or 60 and I jumped it up to 90, it only took a few, a few times on the bike and you just, you just have to force it. Like you force it at first because it's not a habit to take in that much. And it might feel weird at first, but the body adapts quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, it adapts very quickly. Yeah. I think from my perspective, there definitely was a gel, I don't want to say the brand, but in the beginning of this journey for me, Mm -hmm. it was just gloppy and like getting it down. It was, it just was like, it felt, and maybe it was cause it was, it was just gloppy. And I was like, it's just as gross. Is gloppy a word? Gloppy. Yeah. Do you know what gloopy is a gloopy? I have no idea. But do you know, but now do you know what I'm talking about? I think so. What's that? Is that called a, (laughs) what's the word that it's like, um, like slap where it, that you like when you, it sounds like, like slap sounds like slap. It's glo- gloopy, gloppy sounds okay. like. Bleh. All right, so that's what. <laughs> so that's what it felt like, okay. and so I did. I did see it wasn't anything with my stomach. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was like a gag, and I tried. I mean, I actually was using them for a long time until I found a just a smoother gel. Mm-hmm. But it's funny because I used to not. I know what gel you're talking about. I used to not like, and I, I'll say this gel because I'm I'm not speaking badly about it. I used to not like Martin, and I know some people are listening to this, be like, because I was like, oh, it's like a Jello shot. Yeah. But I actually really like them now because they don't taste like much and they go down very clean. And it wasn't that one to me isn't as gloppy as like the other one. But yeah. um, I think if you're part of this question, also might be if it is disrupting your gut because depending on maybe the kind of carbohydrates you're using or how much fluid you take in. I know some people who, who try different brands and they just didn't like it. It did upset their stomach. I mean, I think if you try a new brand and it, it does make your stomach feel terrible, like three, four or five times that might not, there are so many things out there. But I also think if it's mm-hmm. upsetting your stomach, I don't know if it's necessarily the gel you're taking in versus what you're eating prior because a gel, any of the gels on the market are literally simple carbohydrates. No, They're but what if it's not, what if it's not a gel? What if it's like a carb solution mix or like some people like there's all different. Well, then I would say that it's probably too concentrated. Yeah. There's just all different brands and I don't want to say a bunch of names. Because... Well, and I think some brands ha- add per- like perpetuum. I'll say the name brands. <laughs> uh, perpetuum has protein in it. There's yeah. no need to have protein Correct. when you're working out. Right. So that's going to upset your stomach more mm-hmm. than anything else. If you had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, two minutes before you went out and rode and then halfway through you're trying to take in gels and stuff that's not that peanut butter is still in your belly mm-hmm. like it's gonna upset your stomach mm-hmm. when you go intervals like for me 
if I eat a, a raw apple or oh gosh, a, a salad <sighs> oh, or oh gosh, yeah, how, my, how my stomach's hurting. Even just bananas, <laughs> bananas sometimes. Oh, really? Yeah, any fructose type stuff. Yeah. Even if it's three hours before, mm-hmm. it sits in my stomach, mm-hmm. and I'm like puking it up during the ride. But oh, I still need to take gels. It's just in my stomach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's 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 knowing what you're taking in prior to. Yeah if things are upsetting you, I like if an athlete came to me and said, I can't take this gel because it's upsetting my stomach. I wouldn't take the gel away. I would say, well, what are you eating before? Yeah, and then and how much hydration, how much hydration how much are you taking with like, it? You yes. have to look at sodium content, yeah. sweat rate, how mm-hmm. much you actually need hydration wise. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's a balance of three there. And then obviously the pre and post stuff too, but yeah. Um, and one thing you do that I've started doing as well. I mean, for a while is, um, especially not necessarily in a race, maybe because you're, but a lot of times in training, um, I'm doing all different things. Like I'm Mm. doing different types of blocks and different gels and just kind of keeping my stomach guessing. So you're not just used to one thing, especially on a race course, if you have to change. And I will say it is okay to, to switch nutrition products. Like I use something during Placid and I just, I, th- I actually overcarbed in the beginning during Placid and it made me feel pretty sick. Um, and so I had to switch for Kona. I just couldn't, the taste of that. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's just the taste of those blocks. I mean, I'll, I'm sure I'll go back to them. I actually have used them since in training, but I was like, I just need different blocks. And I mean, the mm-hmm. gels I kept. So it, you know, it's one, I mean, there is a psychological component, but if something isn't working or you don't like it, I mean, yeah, switch or try it a different, you know, try to get to the bottom of it. Um, and I think the biggest thing is look at what it's made out of. Like, a oh yeah. Simple fructose gel. I mean, the body, it's not neat. Like it's not, it needs glucose. Like glucose is the number one for you. So you have to look at how that gel is made. It could be brown rice syrup. It could be oh yeah chia seed mix something. Which <laughs> oh, that, I'm just like, why I don't this? like that. One. I know. Um, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> or it could just be like a fruit, a fruit, puree which is all fructose like you need glucose Mm -hmm. in your system and able to actually digest it and so look at what it's made out of um and then also look at the sodium content like some gels have 20 milligrams of sodium some have 200 like that's a very big difference and then comparable to how much hydration you're taking in Mm -hmm. so you got to look at all of it and mm-hmm. not just say, okay, this gel is not for me, but it's like, well, why isn't it for you? Like there, yeah. there's a reason. Yeah. For me, the reason is because the gel is fruity. I do not like fruity flavored gels. Mm. I just don't like the flavor of it. Uh, any, and I've tried like three different brands of fruity flavored gels, yeah, like yeah. berry, yeah. like it's just, I don't even know. So I'm just like, but there's so much out yeah. there. But that's why, I mean, I'm now sponsored by precision hydration, so I'm very biased, but I went to them. Because all of their gels and products are very, like, not plain Jane, but they're not no, I know. way out there crazy, like, uh, fruity tootie. Or- <laughs> <laughs> tootie fruity. <laughs> fruity tootie. But, you know, like, they're not just way out there and just t- weird tasting. And, like, there's other gels I've tried that yeah. I'm like, this is disgusting. Like, yeah. This, this just tastes gross. Yeah. And so it's going to be harder for me to actually just throw it down, yeah. down my throat. I mean, I mm-hmm. will if I have to, but. Mm-hmm. There are gels out there that are very, very tasty, to be honest. So yeah, and I used um, I used some of those precision hydration blocks in Kona. Yeah, I really awesome. like them. They're mm-hmm. they're big, but I like them because they have that milder taste. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna be trying their gels as well for sure. All right, here's our last question, and I love this question. So if you were at camp and you wrote this, I appreciate you. What brings you the most joy as an athlete? And as a coach, Ooh. it's a good wrap up one. That's why I put it at the end. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. What brings me the most joy as an athlete is, uh, feeling just that the journey of the build to the race. It's funny. Um, I don't want to say the finish line, There's, I guess there's two things, just watching the adaptations that happen little Mm -hmm. by little by little and just feeling strong and feeling good. And then what brings me also the most joy as an athlete is within the race, connecting with other, connecting with the crowds and connecting with other people racing and just having that 
moment of togetherness as we're on the race course, which is kind of a culmination of that journey of just feeling like the camaraderie of that. So that's two things for me um, as an athlete. Let um, me answer that. Yeah. Right oh, yeah. Coach. Good, good. Um, so for me as an athlete, it's very similar in the sense of the journey aspect. Like mm-hmm. it's the day to day stuff. It's a way of life for me. Like, yeah, it brings me joy every day to see what I can do every day and like seeing the process week in and week out in the build toward a certain race. I mean, it's what drives me. And then the biggest thing for me is the mind body connection. Like when you're racing, you really have to be engaged physically, mentally, spiritually, like to really get everything you can on that race day, you have to be authentically you in all aspects. And if you put yourself out there and you're doing that, it's the best feeling in the world. And that's what drives me all the time is just like knowing that every race is different and you're pushing yourself to this line and trying to get past that line. I mean, I've never experienced anything really outside of sport that, that really does that for me. Mm. And so, um, it does bring me the most joy to do that. Yeah. Now I want to, now I want to race. It's yeah. the depths of winter. Again. Yeah. I know. All right. As a coach, what brings you the most joy? Um, well, for me, I love seeing the progress in athletes. Mm-hmm. Like Lindsay posted that picture of her oh, from yeah. 2022 or 2023 to 2024 right. in her swim. And it's a dramatic difference. Her whole body position, uh, foot to arm coordination, her whole body rotate. I mean, everything was changed in her swim stroke and to see those changes and to see her excited about it, seeing that and just seeing the progress of what she's done. Uh, I don't necessarily care how they do in a race, like if yeah, they win yeah. or lose or whatever, but knowing that they gave it their all and helping them see the, like the confidence within each and every step of that way. Like, I've had athletes that have had no confidence thinking they could never finish a race. And then they come back and they finish a race, whether it be last or first. And it's just to be part of that is, is I love it. Like it absolutely is so much fun. And like our camps provide that little insight to that, you know, where, um, when you follow an athlete for so many years and you see the progress and the changes, and even if they don't have progress and changes, when they say they have an injury and you have to get them back, like, it's being part of someone else's life in a very monumental way and helping that and supporting and nurturing what they want to do in life and, and providing that opportunity that they can do it, you know, and, and to change the mentality if they have a mentality that's so driven by, by say, for example, outcomes and being able to manipulate that to, to like change that mindset to just seeing what they've got. Like it's, it's fun. I mean, it's a big challenge. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's what gives me the most joy is seeing change. Yes, I love that. Uh, I think for me, it's kind of what you talked about. It is uh, getting our my athletes to believe in themselves mm-hmm. as much as I believe in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and to help them also, for each and every one of them, reach their goals And like you said, and to help them on that journey of that goal, I feel so privileged and honored that they trust me Mm -hmm. with such a big part of their life. And it sounds, everybody listening to this is an athlete and you may or may not have a coach. It doesn't matter. But when you're putting six, nine, 12, 15, some 18 hours, depending on the athlete into your week doing something, that's a monumental amount of time and effort and energy. And I'm thinking about it just as much as they are. And that's what I appreciate from my own coach, somebody who is your cheerleader and sees your potential before you even see it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's why I became a teacher. And that's, you know, and I think for a lot mm -hmm. of people, just as a side thing, they just need someone else to believe in them too, to help them. Like Mm -hmm. I, I remember as a kid, um, I so wanted my dad's attention. Like yeah. I really seriously have a, a father, co- father co- <laughs> and I'm okay to say it now. Um, but when I was younger, I just, I was the athlete of the family and he didn't care at all mm. what I did. It was all about my brother's karate, which is fine. I'm totally fine now, but it's like what, what engaged me into doing track and getting a scholarship and pursuing it was not just like proving it to my dad because he never really gave me the time of day. Right. But it was the coaches I had. Like I, I remember having a coach 
who would come and pick me up, who Mm -hmm. would meet me for spin classes in the morning. Mm -hmm. And she just encouraged me every single day. Mm -hmm. And and she was like my second mom. Like, like when I had my eating, my eating disorder, I went to her. Like she was the one that kind of progressed me and supported me along the Mm way. And my first stress fracture, when I was 14, I got like, my coach sat me down. He's like, I don't care about the 14 year old Angela. I care about the 35 year old Angela. Mm -hmm. Like it was just having someone by my side. And I think that's what a lot of people don't have sometimes, even in the context of families and kids and and their significant partner, like you need an external person to kind of help uplift you. And I think that's what a coach can do for you Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times. And I mean, I rely on my coach for so many things and, and um, it, it changes my day-to-day direction, my thought process, like mm-hmm. just having someone you can text. Like mm-hmm. we all have best friends, but like some mm-hmm. of us don't, but like, I mean, sometimes yeah. like I rely on your texts a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like crap. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's just good to have that, you know, mm-hmm. and having someone that you can trust and believe in and, and just make sure you're going down the direction and journey that they think is positive as well. Yeah. And saving us from, ourselves <laughs> ourselves and training 9000 hours a week cuz we yeah. think we're not ready. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to end that with and maybe something, you know, what thinking about what brings you the most joy as an athlete. If you are still listening to this at the end of this and willing to share that, we would love to hear what brings you joy, um the most joy as an athlete. Email us at i race like a girl at gmail.com and thanks for listening and have a good day. Hey everyone, thanks for listening and we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.